Welcome to You Don't Know Vietnam, the show that demystifies Vietnam for global audiences by talking to the creatives, trendsetters and business owners who are taking on the market. Vietnam isn't all rice paddies and buffaloes, you know, as you're about to find out. I'm Ian Payton, co-founder of We Create Content, and on this episode of You Don't Know Vietnam, I'm talking to documentary filmmaker Quang Nong. I've known Quang since he moved from Vietnam's northern mountains to Hanoi to pursue a dream in documentary filmmaking. Even then, he was creating documentary film that was being both shortlisted for awards and simultaneously banned. He's created multiple shorts about Vietnam's queer scene and is now working on a project that tells the story of his sister's journey through her mental health challenges to motherhood. Today, he talks about why the Oscar shortlisted documentary film Children of the Mist is a milestone for Vietnam and other Vietnamese documentaries you should be looking out for. Quang Hello. <gasps> Hi! <laughs> it's so nice to see you. Okay, nice to see you too. Ian. You've just got back to Vietnam? Yeah, from a month and a half in Montana. Right, what were, you doing? what were you doing? I was attending a film festival, a documentary film festival called Big Sky. Ah. Yeah, it was did fun. You, did, what were you attending in, in, in which capacity? I was a delegate from American Film Showcase and uh, I gave a panel on global documentary filmmaking there wow. and just attend the film festival in general as an audience. It was great having yeah. to pitch a project. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. Did you go by yourself on your own accord or you were... You were... Oh, no, it's sponsored by the American Film Showcase, which is a Department of State program where they bring international filmmakers to America and vice versa. So I'm one of their alumni uh, and they bring me to attend the program. Great. Yeah. Were there any other Vietnamese filmmakers going? I think I might be the only Vietnamese filmmaker in the network. Yeah. Yeah. So this trip, I'm also the only Vietnamese. But there are like nine of us from different countries. Mm. Um, Tunisia, Colombia, Indonesia, mm. etc. Yeah. What did you see? What did you do? Snow and white people. Like it's really white in Montana in different ways. <laughs> But <laughs> that's the first impression that I had. But it was also great to see a full Oscar qualifying documentary film festival in a kind of remote region, but packed with audience going through the snow, minus 20 Celsius degree to see in a theater screen documentary film. It's like a celebration I never see here in Vietnam mm. for the form. Mm. So it was great. And then just attending the pitch of American film projects and sort of like understand the international scene there. Yeah. Did you have much fun out there? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I actually stayed back and the whole trip was a month and a half. So I did Montana, Bozeman, uh, came back to California, travel around San Francisco and work on another shorts when I'm there. Wow. So, yeah. I want to ask about your short, but did you stay out of trouble? Um, if... <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Let's talk about the short. What's the short? Oh, um, so me and my boyfriend have been together for four years and... I'm still trying to find a way to introduce my mom to him. He's mixed and there's no way in Vietnam they can understand the racial nuances. So I'm making a film about his parents and us. Because back in 1967, when his parents met, it was illegal for a black men to be with a white woman. And fast forward to right now, it's illegal for two men to be together. So, you know, people have been loving forever, but it's just illegal for different reasons. So I'm making that to show my mom who my boyfriend is. Mm. It's going to be just a short documentary. When you say illegal for two men to be together, yeah. you mean in Vietnam? In the context of Vietnam, yes. Right. But And you see, like, you know, 1967 America versus 2023 Vietnam. Different reason to be illegal. Right. Yeah. I didn't think it was illegal here. Oh, well, you don't get any recognition. You, If we get married in America, which is legal, he can't get a spousal visa to be in Vietnam with me. Like, it's not recognized. I see. It's not banned, but what's the difference in a way? I see. Got yeah. Because I've always thought that Vietnam was quite liberal and quite open to like LGBTQI. Uh, in right. a way where we don't face overt homophobia, we face lack of legal framework to recognize us. Mm -hmm. So that in itself is a form of discrimination, isn't it? When we're like marginalized being invisible, having no rights. Mm -hmm. So in that aspect, I think it's not equal rights. Right, yeah. Right. Got it. I see. Is it too gay? <laughs> yeah. We're well, not going to carry on. It's never too gay, Quang. <laughs> you're, you're never too gay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
And tell me a little bit about your family and your story, because you come from the north of Vietnam. Right. Um, from the Thai ethnic group. Yeah. So I'm an ethnic minority from Thai ethnic group. I don't really speak the language, so I'm not going to claim that part of my identity. But I did grow up in the mountain before I moved to Hanoi. Mm. And um, yeah. Um, and how did that happen? Because even when I met you five or six years ago, you were like, well into making documentaries and you were oh. making some pretty um, controversial documentaries <laughs> even then. Yeah. So at what point did that happen? You know, you're up in, where was it? Was it Lao Kai? Kai? Yeah. yeah. So you're up in Lao Kai. Mm -hmm. And how does that happen? Where, how do you go from being there to kind of knowing that you want to make film? Oh, so like most kids, I moved to Hanoi to study university when I'm 18 and I already knew that I wanted to do something with film then. I was making silly shorts with my friends and that got me out of getting bullied because it's hard to bully a funny one. Mm -hmm. And so making silly video was my way to make it through high school. And then I decided to want to study something more serious, but I was attending a business school. So I took up a documentary class because it was free and I made my first short documentary, mm -hmm. which I used our company computer back then to edit. Well, we create content. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> It was about a gay dating app when my ex then cheated on me and used the app. So I met a bunch of other people and then make a short about the scenes. So that was my very first documentary. Right. Yeah. So for those listening that didn't get that reference, Quang used to work for our content agency. We create content and he was using our equipment and our time. <laughs> <laughs> to edit his very own documentary about Grindr. It was outer hour, okay? <laughs> By the way, it was fine. I think we knew it. It was absolutely fine. Put your name in the credit. Yeah. Thanks, we create content. So. <laughs> yeah. And didn't that get banned or something? It did got banned. It got shortlisted for an award locally, maybe to top three. They, could, they was going to screen it at the theater, but it got banned. So it was quite a shock for me. As a baby filmmaker, I was 19 at the time. Mm. So... Yeah, it, I got my first film banned, but then it did lead to me making two more shorts about queer scenes. Since the time it was with uh, Gaga Ulala, which is a streaming platform based in Taiwan, and the short went on to be sold to Apple TV and Amazon. Wow! Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know either until I looked it up the other day. I'm like, holy shit! Okay, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so why did that get banned? Um, uh, well, I guess being explicitly queer, showing sexual action or depiction of sex mm. is still a taboo back in the day, mm. six years ago. Mm. Yeah. What was it called, that? that? Search, the documentary. Mm. Yeah. Search. Yeah. It, it was like first attempt, so like you can see a ton of flaws and stuff. Well, I'm like, sure, but I remember watching it and being um, pretty moved by it. I thought it was really powerful. Because oh. um, you were like literally having guys over and putting the camera like right there right right it was very much a pillow talk yeah and like you know after the fact we talked about our experience using the apps and i was fumbling my way as a baby gay because from lao kai there was no gays and come to hanoi the closest one is probably next door when i went on the apps so mm -hmm. suddenly i have all the identity that i'm free to explore that i didn't have the liberty to before mm. yeah and i remember in the office, you were super excited because it got shortlisted. And yeah. then like within hours, I think it was like super gutted because it got banned. <laughs> <laughs> what a twist. Who does that? A lot twist. Yeah. Do you feel like as a documentary filmmaker, you must be doing something right if it's if it's getting the attention of, of A, um, awards and B, the authority? I have no clue because there was no understanding of what how the system works. Mm. Um, I didn't sign up to be banned for sure, but back in the day, the goal, and, and, and even to now, the goal is just to get the film made and whatever recognition you get out of it is sort of the byproduct because it's so hard and long to make a doc. Mm. And we're talking about independent film, not like branded documentary where you're hired. So that's kind of different. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, what have you been working on since with regards to your own projects? So, I see the three short about queers being my little trilogy about growing up gay in Vietnam. Mm. First I explored the grinder scene, then I deep into the history of queer culture, and then the future forward where I make a biopic talk about Danny, mm. another with great content staff. Mm. Um, so after those three short, I 
didn't prepare to make my first feature length film, but I ended up making one and it's been four years since because the story sort of like happened naturally as well. My so I, I kinda of don't want to reveal too much about what this about because it's still being made. Sure. Yeah. 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 But it's very much basically about my uh, mentally ill sister's journey to become a mother. Right. And it's been four years since I've been working on it. Yeah. And you have told me about that before. Yeah. I recall now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when do you expect that might be done and ready to screen? I hope I hope twenty twenty four, because we're still in production, late production. But uh funding need to come into place. And at least now that the COVID restrictions over, we can actually travel to get the film developed at uh, film labs, like navigating that independent film system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe 2024, by the time we have funding in place to finish editing as well. Did you say film labs? Yes. What's that? So basically, there are uh, film institutions slash film labs all over the world that develop these independent film. I'm, I'm talking specifically in the documentary world because that's what I'm familiar with, but it exists in, f- uh, in fiction realm as well. Mm. A film doesn't just get made and then festival pick it up. It's more like the festival pours the resources into these labs to develop a filmmaker when they're in early production of their film, uh, to help shaping the story with expert. And once they get a rough cut stage, they can look into the rough cut and help with editing. Mm. Uh, and then you can also pitch to get funding. Uh, which I did several times, and I did gain funding through that. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually in country with more established film industry, they would have resources from the government to fund independent filmmaking. So you're not limited to biopic of celebrity or true crime on Netflix. Right. There are independent voices being heard because the resources help these kind of stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. But that's not quite the case yet in Vietnam. We are building one. Um, so I work... Uh, at Doxigata, which is a we're like a collective of filmmakers who have been working on feature length film that have been traveling to these film labs. One of us got a Oscar shortlist, Alicia from Children of the Mist. Wow. The film is being screened in theater. Yeah. So we all navigate all these labs and opportunity by ourselves, but how do we cascade that knowledge to the generation of filmmakers that are aspiring to make film. And that's what we're working together. Like we've been doing this for three years where we have a workshop, call for project, people apply, we help shaping the story. So when they are still out in the field working, they know certain directions are better than another or different choices they could make. And then after that, um, we could also help them with applying for a festival if it's like of a certain standard. Mm. But we're still like uh, kind of early as well. Um, yeah, this is going to be your f- three or four of our activity. What was the name of that collective again? Doc Cicada. Right. Yeah, like the book Cicada. Right, right. Yeah, because okay, we stay at the ground for years and then suddenly loud noise. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah. So would you say that, especially with Children of the Mist mm. being nominated yeah. for an Oscar? Uh, shortlisted. She did not get to the nomination round, but she got to top 15 out of hundreds of great film. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say it kind of symbolizes Vietnam having a bit of a moment with regards to documentary and film? It certainly brings a lot of attention because it's the first film in history in Vietnam to ever do so in documentary. We have one film that uh, uh, that, that got to, I think the nomination it was um, Green Papaya by Chen Ning Hung. It's a fiction film, but it was a French film. It's a French production. It wasn't a Vietnamese, Vietnamese production. So if you look into that aspect, this is the first Vietnamese Vietnamese film to made it that far in the Oscar um, awarding season by its own actor. I see. She had no money for uh, like um, campaigning for work because campaigning for Oscar costs a lot of money. And if your film are backed by a big studio, they're going to throw money in because that's credits. She did not, but she made it that far. To be shortlisted, so she's top fifteen, and wow. to be there, you already have to went through several rounds of winning the best award at an Oscar quality film festival. Then you get to the long list. Then they narrow it down to the shortlist. Right. So hundreds of films that have won best film at, at film festival around the world already are the initial pool. Right. She made it top fifteen. Nominations five. Award is one. Yeah, yeah. So that's why Oscar seemed like such a benchmark because it has such a long. Um, layers to like, like many filter rounds. people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. so it got through 
Mm -hmm. you know, because of the power of the story alone, right? Yeah, seriously, there was no campaigning activity that, like, yeah. Oh, that's, that's so impressive. And I went to watch it at mm -hmm. the cinema uh, last week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it, it was, I really, really enjoyed it. I sat down with my cheese popcorn and my 7-Up and realized that there, there were no English subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> so I obviously I watched it and still really enjoyed it and understood the story. Yeah. Um, I couldn't quite understand the, the nuance right. involved and, and obviously the conversation. Because mm. a lot of the time they're speaking in Hmong, right? Uh -huh. And then the, tra the, tra the subtitle is Vietnamese. Yeah. And my Vietnamese is really, really not as good as it should be. At so, least we got you to one film screening. <laughs> oh, but I still just absolutely love the documentary. And there's something about like not being able to understand what's being said that I was observing like different things in, in the documentary, like the framing and what's being included in the frame and what's not and right. and the way it's shot. And, and, and I mean, how would you describe uh, very quickly for the audience what The Children of the Mist is about? Um, it's about a lost childhood of a Hmong girl who is torn between modernity and tradition. Um, Hmong people has a tradition of loosely translated to bride napping, when they kidnap the bride. Um, but it's not just a catchy translation that makes it special. It's a very lengthy uh, process to have young couple getting married. But still, they're around like 15 years old when they do that. Mm. And it can be violent. It the director experienced or like observed that among her peers and she wanna make a film that capture the childhood of the main protagonist. So she followed the protagonist from her early teens until the tradition happened on to the protagonist and the choices that the protagonist made. Yeah. So it's a very important film because the gaze the director has is the director itself herself is a ethnic minority as well. Uh, she's Thai like me. Uh, the protagonist is Mum. So you have a female ethnic minority filmmaker making a film about a female story in a remote region. This is what the documentary world is trying to reach, which is to eliminate the colonial gaze. Because you have white people, American, coming to Vietnam making documentary all the time. We're not trying to have a voice for who are you to tell this story. And the director is the right person to tell this story because she's very close to the subject, her identity aligned with what the protagonists go through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, like it's, it's a good film. So that, was that funded though? It was funded by a bunch of different bodies, right? Because that was like a four year project, I imagine, that she was working on, or more. It's not like you have this chunk of money and then you start production like in fiction. Uh, most of the time, it would be you go through your project, based on what you have resource wise you manage to film something good enough you edit a trailer out of it you go to pitching forum if they think you're the best project among 10 others who are also good they give you a small amount of money mm. and you use a credit to apply for funding further in different phase so we have to apply for development funding production funding post-production funding each call for different aspects you only need a trailer for development funding with a production they need to see 20 minutes of your film mm. for post Russians they need to see the rough cut, which can be around three hours. So it's a work in progress all the time until it finished, and funding and funding doesn't come through from the beginning. Mm -hmm. What I know from the case, she also had went through the film labs and the funding system. She did one award in funding, and it's, I'm so happy for her because she deserved all that. But it was not like she was given a big chunk of money to make a film right. at all. She managed to convince them to. And also throughout that almost three to four years period, it was, every time on set, it was just her. She herself, the camera, the character of four years of her life. Mm. Yeah, uh, she would spend months in Saba documenting life mm. and then go back and edit. So yeah, it's it a very- a sound person as well, right? Well, she did the sound herself. There's a mic on the camera. Like it's, yeah. an, it's a Swiss army knife of a, <laughs> of a camera operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I was, because I was not able to understand the language. I was really picking up the sound. Yeah. And I was quite impressed with all the, the different sounds. And it's I good that it's not noisy there. Like ambience in yeah. Sapa is very different. Yeah. Are there any other documentary filmmakers mm. or films that you would like recommend I or global audiences watch? 
coming out of Vietnam. Recent ones? Not necessarily. I mean, recent would be oh, cool, but... Okay. I would say um, there are duck institutions in Vietnam previously that has made an impact. Um, experimental film can look into what Hanoi Duck Lab produced. Uh, observational style film look into Barong Vietnam. They are the production company slash institution behind Zim's film in that style of observational film. What was it called again? Uh, Varang, V-A-R-A-N, mm-hmm. Varang Vietnam. They're from France, so a lot of that philosophy teaching is in there. Mm-hmm. And now we have this crop of independent filmmakers who have access because internet democratizes a lot of access and knowledge. So I know work in progress. Um, my producer, Chang Dao, has a film. I think it's now called um, Such a Story About Romance. Uh, she's in post right now, so that's going to be, after the film, film's going to be the next doc from Doc Cicada. Um I know another filmmaker from South Vietnam making one about her family, um, Living Room War, where her grandfather basically was broadcasted as a missing person being being sought after by different families when he was with her family in South Vietnam. Right. So Vietnam War story from a family perspective. Right, right. So... And and the other film that I mentioned, um, uh, such a story about romance, is about this two thirty years old friends, girlfriends, trying to find um, a way to have their first boyfriend. It's very intimate, funny, personal. The commonality of these film is they are not sit down interview about his story wartime like what audience would see on TVs but it's like personal story that are relevant to the documentary filmmaker and that's I think is what's going to come up next mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So, so that's to be look out for yeah now have you seen filmmaking change in Vietnam if any throughout the years mm. uh, I'm, I'm going to just speak within the documentary realm because I am only familiar with that I would say Access and equipment democratize the process. So one man band is possible to make a film and people have been learning and have easy access to good equipment now so they can actually produce decent quality stuff mm-hmm. with not much money. So that allow a lot of independent filmmakers to, beside working for client or freelance work, they use the same skill set to tell stories that matter to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think... Um, our generation of younger filmmakers who speak the lamb- who speak English and are able to access funding and opportunity abroad also can bring local story abroad. And I also see uh, trends of foreign-born Vietnamese, so people from the Vietnamese di- diaspora trying to connect with their identity as Vietnamese. Mm-hmm. They will go back to Vietnam, make a film about that, or make a film about being Vietnamese abroad. Mm-hmm. That's also a Vietnamese film. And that's actually one that uh, is going to be screened at Hot Dogs, which is a major documentary film festival in Canada, uh, called Ma Saigon. It's made by, I think, a uh, Montreal filmmaker. It's a feature link talk about queer people in South Vietnam, I think. Mm-hmm. I just saw the trailer yesterday. I think it's really good. Mm. Yeah. What's that called? Ma Saigon, like Mother Saigon. Right, right. Yeah. 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 So, Vietnamese, in Vietnam, Vietnamese board are making film about Vietnam in different angles. Mm. And I think that's exciting. And it's not funded by this big uh, news organization or Vietnamese government, but just by filmmakers themselves who have a story that they want to tell, something mm. they care about. It doesn't have to be a big social issue. It can just be a very small and intimate story about your close friend mm. or your neighbor, but interesting story, or like in my case, my sister. Yeah, mm. but if the story is good, it's good. Mm. Mm. I know you're working on the documentary with your sister, or about your sister, yeah. should I say. Mm-hmm. Um, are you able to work on more than one thing at a time, or mm. no? I think when I first started, I didn't expect scale of the project to be what it is right now. But after COVID, the only thing that I work on has been this film, and it's really draining. So now I realize I can actually use that approach to tell different story that matters to me too. So I've been working on several short. I think short film... Are much more liberating because it doesn't take as much time. Mm. It takes four to seven years to make a feature length documentary, but maybe only one year for a short. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. And you yeah. can juggle? Yeah. So I am my own employer right now. I only pick on projects, commercial projects that I like or that are paid enough. And if not, I'm just going to continue working on my film, which I can also seek to find funding, which also helps with my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And what sort of commercial projects mm. will you be working on? Like what sort of um, briefs are you getting and from which sort of companies and brands? So I mostly do commission doc projects, British Council being one of them. Mm -hmm. So I do work uh, with them on small things or like little micro doc about the programs uh, or if some other art institution like Heritage Space want to make a micro doc, you can work with them too. Mm -hmm. So usually those and I don't advertise too much about commercial work that I do because it would opportunity cost for my own film. So I kind of am limiting what I do so I have resources to do my own thing. Right. Yeah. But I think once my film is done, I'll be able to take on different things. Is that why British Council aren't working with us anymore? <laughs> 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 well. <laughs> Thanks, Quang. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Podcast over. <laughs> No, they're doing a lot. Yeah, they're doing a lot right now because of obviously the fifty-year anniversary between yeah. Britain and Vietnam. Well, not the only freelancer they have. I know. I'm joking. I know. I'm joking. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm joking. Thank you. And the other question I was going to ask, and I know you don't want to talk about it too much. Yeah, no, feel free. Yeah. With regards to the documentary you're making right now, mm -hmm. your family, but how is that like as as an experience? Because you're obviously really close to your family, mm. and you're very embedded and entangled, I imagine, in, in the story. Yeah. How are you able to kind of, or do you not want an objective kind of, mm. how are you able to midwife that story and not make it your story? What you asked is a very important question in regard to doc, which is subjectivity and objectivity. There are different takes on what a doc should be. For me personally, it would be a documentary is something you work with, uh, material from reality. But you can be creative with it. You can have bias because we're humans. I don't think there's going to be any true subjectivity in filmmaking. The filmmaker will have the authority to shape the story. So I own up to that. I put myself in the film. I let the people know this is my perspective. And I can't help but having that perspective because when I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a son, I'm a brother in the family. And I think other documentary filmmakers also go through that, no matter how close the subject is to them. Um, so, own up to your subjectivity is my personal approach to shaping a story that's super close to you into a good story. Right. Yeah. So, you're actually in the doc? I am in the doc as a character, too. Mm. Um, and I think the understanding of doc, it, when, when we say documentary in Vietnam, it, it rings a bell of something boring and like authoritative and factual based or like similar to news. But there's so many different types of docs. And I think what's missing in Vietnam is a good documentary film festival that encourage people to see documentary differently. It's kind of like a branding problem. When you think of the term, you think of fact and science and history. But in fact, there's so many creative documentary out there. I would say creative documentary is a term worth looking into. Uh, very much about your imagination, uh, your take on reality, how you fictionalize it. It can be funny. It can be ridiculous. It doesn't have to be fact. So that's my understanding and my approach. Mm. Yeah. Are there any other themes that you're keen to explore in the future with documentary filmmaking? Obviously, you talk a lot about the and have done a lot of work in the queer space, mm. um, mental health. Mm. You know, what other issues are there that you feel strongly about or would like to explore in the future? Have you thought about that much? No, I'm too busy with the one that I have right now. One day at a time. One time, I, I would say like like I'm. I don't want to, I, I, I thought I didn't want to brand myself as someone who made queer talk, but it's happened to be the kind of subject that I'm interested in because I'm queer. Like You're not, are you? I, oh, <laughs> the audience should see what I'm wearing right now. I have two ducks on my ears and yellow glasses and very iconic shoes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, but... Um, Branding, pigeonholing yourself. Yeah, but the thing is, as me personally, I'm, I would only want to spend years of my life with a story that I care about. And if it happens to be about being queer or queer experience, then it's that. Mm. I am editing a short that I work with IC. Um, I see. I see. It's like an NGO. It's like Frontier of Fighting for Queer Rights and Marginalized Small Group Rights. I forgot what the abbreviation stand for. <laughs> but I'm editing a doc that I direct about a gay marriage in a rural village in Vietnam. Like rural village, but big gay marriage and 
they still don't get the law recognition, but they decide to organize it anyway with kids and families and neighbors and everything. Mm -hmm. So making a short about that, making a short about a a Cambodian refugee turned king master in Australia. Like he used to be tortured when they flee the country and now he's a bondage master who used rope to pleasure people. (laughs) So that... How did you find like... He's my boyfriend's friend. <laughs> and also, like, I, I guess, like, we just attract people that we care and our entity align with. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I think, like, you know, that form can speak so many things that we can, yeah, we can write it out, post a status on Facebook, but we happen to know how to express ourselves in a form. And I choose to use that with a documentary. Mm-hmm. You know, so I care about gay rights, so I make a talk about that. Mm-hmm. I care about my sister, so I make a talk about her. Yeah. So... Yeah, we'll see what interests me Yeah. next. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And talking about gay rights, mm. I just want to go rewind a little bit to the time that you were living in Singapore. Because mm. you got a scholarship, right? No, I just, oh, I got a job. <laughs> Not a scholarship, but a job to work and study at the same time. So it wasn't that expensive to study. Oh, that's, that's right. You had a scholarship in Canada that you chose to go to Singapore. Nope, I failed the scholarship in Canada, so I have no scholarship. I'm poor. Give me money. I just <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay, sorry. But I got a bunch of funding out of not. Yeah, but anyway. So you so. actually went to La Salle in Singapore. <laughs> I right? did. Yes, La Salle College of Arts. Yeah, and because I think a lot of people feel like Vietnam is is really strict in mm-hmm. terms of. Um, is policies and mm. LGBTQI, for example. Mm. But what are the differences you felt as a gay guy living mm. in Singapore compared to Vietnam? And how mm. was your experience in Singapore generally? So before Singapore, before seeing the world, I guess, we only know, I only know the norm in Vietnam. Mm. Um, the norm being not having good representation and visibility. Mm. But I don't face, or at least me, luckily, haven't faced any overt discrimination when I'm out on the street. People stare, but that, as much as they do, they didn't throw stuff at me. Right. Um, I think queer experience in Vietnam has so many nuances and that I'm sure people have better answer to how bad it has been for them because I know it's not amazing. But when I was in Singapore, um, I feel more intense heat there's actual law not allowing you to have a good depiction of queer people on television by the government. So that kind of trickled down to how society see people and I just don't feel comfortable being as loud and expressive. I feel like people are um, apathetic in Vietnam and in Singapore I feel a sense of I have to watch out when I'm out in the street. I didn't face anything bad but right. what surprised me basically to sum it up is singapore was a progressive ish country in my eye it was like modern rich great clean but the attitude about being queer i feel like vietnam is more open like in singapore they have blonde policy limiting you like as a foreigner you can't participate in pink dot which is their version of yeah. pride and no positive portrayal you can only be a pedophile or this kind of story mm. it's actually true and so and they also had the section 377a when i was in singapore it was hasn't been repealed yet it criminalized gay sex mm. it was just repealed but they also introduced law that limit challenging the definition of marriage so i feel like you know not great yeah yeah i remember that because they were like oh yeah you you know, we're not gonna. It's not gonna be illegal to have gay sex now, but mm. we'll never legalize marriage. Or, or yeah, in that, marriage. like, it was not a full-on victory for the activists who worked so hard for that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Whereas here, um, we don't have a major religion preaching hatred. We don't have um, overt discrimination in policy. We have invisibility. But that's from my limited understanding, because I pass as straight if I want to. If I come across as more feminine or androgynous, or if I'm trans, my experience will be much different. Mm. And from close friends, I know they face those issues with people not respecting or giving them like proper treatment. Mm. Yeah, so that exists. Mm. Yeah, but I'm just in a privileged position to not experience it. And I think that exists 
yeah. still everywhere, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Wherever you are, you're going to have those, those people that mm-hmm. um, aren't going to accept it. Mm. Uh, I do feel like in Vietnam, the Vietnamese, are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I find the Vietnamese very open-minded and accepting on the whole. I actually agree with you on that, yeah. Um, it's easier to educate people who doesn't know compared to undoing years of hatred, and we don't have that. Mm. So it's just people are curious to something new, mm. and they have like that general, more accepting, friendly attitude. That's how I feel yeah. Yeah, as well. So you didn't stay in Singapore that long, from what I remember. Yeah, I managed to come back right around COVID time. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then I started working on my feature length. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I'm, I can't wait to see them. Me too. I just want it to be done and out of my life. It's like an overlong pregnancy. <laughs> you say that, and then as soon as you actually like publish it or we'll screen see. it. Well, okay. Uh, distribution for film in Vietnam, documentary only really get to shown in cinema. If it got shortlisted to Oscar or win a lot of award. I think this is the second or third, third film that I, in recent memory, that I screened in theater in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. It just get done and screened elsewhere, which is fine. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask you just a little bit more about Vietnam mm. um, for our audience. What are you most excited about for Vietnam? Ooh, that's broad, huh? It is really broad. And nothing is okay as well. Oh, yeah. Well... Well, I just came back from a trip to the States and I get to understand the way life can be different. And now that I'm coming back, I realize we have so many potential texture, stories, visibility that's going to um, be portray more media representations. So those local stories with more independent filmmakers getting recognition, I'm excited to, to see that. Where it's no longer just foreigners making film about Vietnam, it's going to be Vietnamese making good Vietnamese film about Vietnam. Um, so I'm excited for that, mm. the new crop of filmmaker, mm. and for the country in general. I'm just happy that we have a train system in place in Hanoi, and I can't wait for another ten years. So we had another <laughs> line. <laughs> yeah, when you say train system, you mean one train line. Yeah, but it's fast. It's the closest thing you'd ever see in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, it's getting there getting there they're building the underground as well from Catling station yeah it's happening in Ho Chi Minh City as well mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. it's almost feeling like a real city almost yeah. <laughs> we're gonna get cancelled with the government <laughs> well thanks for coming on yeah. to you don't know Vietnam wow I hope I didn't sound too stupid like <laughs> <is there> <laughs> you, you never sound stupid Quang. you never sound stupid mm-hmm. um I really appreciate you coming on. It's really nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. And um, make sure you're sending me previews of your docs. Oh. I don't want to be just like a man in the crowd, all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want early access. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Okay. Thank you, Ian. And, and, and watch out for... Well, no, that's, that's not the right word. I just want to say, like, be on the lookout or something for the audience to, like, you know, go see Children of the Mist when it's still screening in theater. Yeah. 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 Go see Children of the Mist. It's a good Vietnamese film. How would people see it if they're not in Vietnam? I think uh, it's still touring globally. It's been touring at film festival the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And uh, they will get distribution. In America, I think it would be a part of the POV series on PBS. Mm-hmm. Whereas in other countries, they might be eventually streaming on their Vimeo. Because right. I do find a Vimeo link um, that you can pay to access, but it's geoblocked in Vietnam. So distribution, it will be available in your country. Yeah. Just follow their Facebook for updates. Do you reckon it will go onto one of the big streaming platforms? Hmm? Do you reckon it will go onto the one, of, one of the big streaming platforms eventually? Yeah, we'll see. Mm, but, I yeah. hope so. Mm. Okay. So should we go and get some bun ka? Oh, yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thanks, Quang. Thanks, Ian. Take care. Yeah, take care. You too. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to You Don't Know Vietnam. I'm Ian Payton from We Create Content. I'd like to thank DJ Jay from the Beat Saigon for the soundtrack and to you for making it all the way to the end.